In this lecture, we will talk about the order Ranunculales. This is one of our earliest diverging lineages within the Eudicots. We will be discussing three families. We'll discuss Ranunculaceae, the family that gives the order its name. This is the buttercup family, and this is one member of that family, uh, Clematis, which is a popular garden uh, vine. We also will discuss um, the Barberry family, Berberidaceae, and these flowers are from Berberis, the genus that gives the family its name. Finally, we will discuss the poppy family, Papaveraceae, and this is a picture of California poppy, one member of that group. Here is <coughs> a phylogeny just to remind you where we are. Remember that um, everything pictured here is a flowering plant. And we started by talking about things like Amborellaceae and Nymphaceae, um, as well as the Magnolias and Lauraceae. So all of those form this grade, this paraphyletic group of early diverging uh, flowering plants or angiosperms. We now have progressed up the phylogeny to this big division between the monocots and the eudicots. The monocots here they're showing as a collapsed branch. So there are many, many species um, in various orders and families, but they've just collapsed it down to the word monocots here. When we come back to the monocots later, we'll see this expanded. For now, let's focus on the eudicots and come up this way. What we can see is that there's one small group that diverges earlier, then ranunculale, ranunculales rather, is our next order of early diverging eudicots. Since we are now in the eudicots, we expect to see some traits that um, are in common. And the one that they have recorded here is tricolpate pollen, meaning that there are three pollen apertures. We talked about that trait for the, as a uh, synapomorphy of the eudicots already. And if we expand the eudicots out, we can see that there's a lot more diversity as we start looking at some smaller groups. Um, what I want you to see here is that among the uh, eudicots we'll be discussing, again, you can see Ranunculales is the first group to diverge. So what are some characteristics of the Ranunculales? They are primarily herbaceous. Now this is not a, uh, this does not indicate that the ancestor of the group was not woody because the earliest diverging family within Ranunculales is in fact woody. However, um, woodiness is less common within this group. Additionally, they are commonly have toothed, lobed, or compound leaves. And so you can see that here, the, uh, way, the indentations look sort of like dissections in many cases. So these cuts down towards the middle. And you can see that for Aconitum in the buttercup family, Colophyllum in the Biberidaceae, and Corydalis in the Papaveraceae. Sometimes the uh, divisions between the leaves go all the way down to the leaf margin, and those leaves become compound leaves. Um, it looks offhand like that's true for Corydalis over here, or at least it's getting really close to having a compound leaf. Next, let's talk a little bit about flowers in this order. The flowers are typically hypogynous, meaning that all of the other flower parts, like petals and stamen, are diverging from the flower beneath the carpel. The carpel then has a superior ovary or that the flower has a superior ovary. They typically have many stamen per flower, and the parts are typically distinct, so there's not either connation or adnation of flower parts. And we will start by looking at the poppy family, Papaveraceae. Poppies are typically annuals or perennials, so not woody, and they last either for one year or multiple years. The leaves are usually alternate, but they can be sub-opposite. Sub-opposite simply meaning 
approximately opposite, but the leaves aren't coming off perfectly across from one another. As we already said for the order, leaves for this family tend to be lobed or divided or dissected. The flowers are either solitary, as pictured here, or in a cyme, um, which we've already talked about. And we'll talk about this more. The Papaveraceae family now is circumscribed to include Fumariaceae. This is a group that used to be in their own family, but um, to keep the Papaveraceae monophyletic, we now include members of Fumariaceae in Papaveraceae. This is going to be important for you in laboratory when you're keying out plants. Because if you are keying out a plant that is in the old Fumariaceae, then Radford Ollies and Bell will still have it listed there. You'll have to key it out in Fumariaceae, but when you record the family on your exam, you'll have to specify that the plant is in Papaveraceae. And so I've already mentioned this dissected leaf trait. Here I'm going to show you some pictures. Here are three different um, species within the family. And what we can see is that while the leaves look different in all cases, in all cases they are dissected with these cuts going in very close to the central vein. That's true here, that's true in all three of these cases, up to the point where this third one resembles, or I'd even say is a compound leaf. We'll talk about some characteristics of the group, and then we'll look at some examples. So as you know, Papaveraceae is eudicots, and they are most typically herbs, although there is some woodiness within the family. We won't see that. We've already mentioned the leaf lobing or divisions. Um, and the leaf arrangement typically alternate. Flowers are perfect or bisexual. Flowers are solitary or in cymes. Their symmetry is going to vary depending on whether they are members of that old Fumari AC group or whether they are members of the traditional Papaveraceae group. So <clears throat> members of the traditional Papaveraceae are radially symmetric or actinomorphic. Those in the old Fumari AC are bilaterally symmetric, which we also will call zygomorphic. Those are synonyms. These flowers now have sepals. Remember in many of the basal angiosperms, sepals were not clearly separated from petals, and we often use the term tepals. But here it's pretty clear what are sepals versus what are petals. There are usually only two or sometimes three sepals. Um, there's no fusion um, of sepals, and that's true for most of the flower parts in all of the orders we'll talk about today. We will see a couple exceptions. And importantly, the sepals are deciduous, meaning that they fall off when the flower is mature. Why is this important? Well, first, if you notice deciduous sepals, then that is a clue it might be in this family. Second, if you are looking at the flower and there are no sepals, then you have to remember that maybe there were sepals earlier um, when the flower was less mature, and maybe those sepals have um, fallen off. The petals have two whorls. Um, so this is a new trait. Um, we're used to seeing in the basal angiosperms spiraled petals um, that don't form whorls, but here we are starting to have more uh, uh, complex flowers, including these whorls. And there are two whorls, either two petals per whorl in some cases, or three petals per whorl in some cases. And unfortunately, to make life complicated, there are other cases when there are many petals and it is not closely uh, uh, regulated with just the two whorls with a specified number of petals. The petals are distinct, so there's no fusion between them. Androecium, the stamens are numerous. And again, that's a characteristic of the order um, and it's applying to the family. So many stamen 
They're probably countable, but sometimes more than you'd prefer to count. The gynoecium, um, like members of this family or of this order generally, superior. Now here's a case of fusion. There are two carpels that are fused together that form the pistil. Those two carpels in fusing together have one opening or one locule inside, and the placentation is parietal. The fruit is a capsule, um, and I think we'll look at that um, either in the subsequent slides or in laboratory, um, but that's going to be a helpful uh, trait for identifying this family. Some members of this family have milky latex. Um, it tends to be toxic, and in some cases that latex is brightly colored. So we'll look at a couple of examples here. First, we have sanguinaria. Um, which is blood root, and that's pictured on the top. You can see in this case, it's not um, doing two sets of two or three petals. This would be one of the cases where it has many petals instead. I'm just going to italicize sanguinaria. And if you were to break a leaf off of a blood root, then you would see an orangish or reddish sap come out. Um, and that is what gives it the name blood root. Um, and that's also an example of the milky toxic latex in members of this family. The flower pictured at bottom here is a member of the old Fumariaceae group. Remember that Fumariaceae, I'm just going to add that. Is distinguished from Papaveraceae by the fact that it has bilaterally symmetric flowers. And you can see that really clearly here. Um, Dicentris canadensis is known as squirrel corn. Um, it doesn't look especially corn-like to me, but I guess some people think it does. And it's a native wildflower that occurs throughout eastern North America. Also, while you're looking at this, notice the highly dissected leaves, um, again, typical of the family. We are going to move on now and talk about our next family, which is the buttercups. This is Ranunculaceae, again, the family that gives the order its name. And Ranunculaceae gets its name from the genus Ranunculus, which is the buttercup genus. Like Papaveraceae, these are typically herbs but there are shrubs and the shrub that we are likely to see is yellow wood um, which grows along stream banks. The leaves are typically alternate and like we've seen for other members of the order they tend to be lobed or dissected. The stamens are oftentimes petaloid so they have a petal-like look to them. Like other members of the family they have or of the order um, this family tends to have many stamen, and unlike Papaveraceae, it has many distinct carpels. So remember, Papaveraceae had two fused carpels, making one pistil. In this case, each of the carpels is going to be attached independently um, to the receptacle, and that will help you differentiate between the two families. Um, in some, but not all cases, the petals are spurred. A spur is one of these appendages pointing off towards the back of the flower or the base of the flower. A spur um, typically contains nectar and it's a way of sequestering that nectar so that only pollinators with long tongues, um, hummingbirds or bumblebees or butterflies can access that pollen. In this case, this is a flower with a hummingbird syndrome. And by sequestering that pollen away from other pollinators, then it means that the pollinators they prefer are more likely to find nectar when they visit, and so those pollinators are more likely to visit. And then if those pollinators are looking for other similar plants, it helps reduce pollen transfer between species. So it's a, a specialized pollination mechanism to help reduce pollen contamination. And so in all three of these flowers, you can see many anthers, many anthers, 
and many anthers. We can also see, um, especially in this flower on the far right, um, this buttercup flower, you can see that there are many distinct carpels. Each of these little white spots is its own stigma. And so it looks like there's at maybe a couple dozen um, separate carpels in this flower. Let's go over some characteristics of the family. First, um, as we already said, these are most commonly herbs. The leaves are usually deeply lobed or divided. Flowers are perfect or bisexual. Flowers are solitary or in cymes, and that is the same as in Papaveraceae. Flowers can be actinomorphic or zygomorphic. Um, again, that was also true of Papaveraceae. In this case, the perianth, so the um, sepals and petals, are spiraled. There are more sepals than in Papaveraceae, typically five to eight. Again, there's not a lot of fusion um, in these families that we're talking about. So the sepals are separate from one another. They can look petaloid. So in other words, even though they're sepals, they will have a petal-like appearance. Petals are variable. There can be few or many. They are distinct, so not fused. And in some cases, there's a spur. It's not necessarily common. But if there is a spur, that's a clue to think about this family. Stamen are many, and they are spiraled instead of being whorled. Um, spiraling is still going to be common because we're still talking about early diverging eudicots. Papaveraceae is um, an example of something that is starting to get more control um, and is instead whorled, but it's not unusual to see spiraled still. The gynoecium is superior, as we said, for this order generally. There tends to be many carpels. That could mean anything from six to dozens. There is one locule in each with one um, ovule per carpel. They are distinct. So as we said, they are separately attached to the um, receptacle and they can break apart when they disperse. Um, since they are separately attached carpels, it's an aggregate fruit, and the fruit can be different types of fruit, so we'll leave it broad. Okay, we will move on now to the Berberidaceae. Berberidaceae is the barberry family. These are herbs or shrubs, and Shrubbiness is more common in this family than in the two families we've just talked about. Um, we do have herbaceous members, but among what we'll see, they're about 50-50 herbaceous, so lacking wood or shrubby and with wood. Um, we have an alternate leaf arrangement again, and so that's in common among all three of the families we've talked about. And I've told you this earlier, but remember that alternate leaf arrangement is the norm. And so that's always what you should guess. And you should memorize the ones that are not opposite. Now, in this case, flowers are typically three maris. So what that means is when there are parts that have regular numbers, there are going to be multiples of three, three, six, nine, etc. Um, that's true for some of the poppies. Remember, those had some parts that were either two plus two or three plus three, um, but it's more regular for the barberries. I will skip ahead here and we'll go over the family characteristics. Then I'll go back and I'll show you a couple of examples. So as we've already said, the barberries are herbs or shrubs with alternate leaves. They have perfect um, flowers. So they have both their gynoecium and their androecium. The flowers are radially symmetric or actinomorphic. The perianth has multiple whorls and they can range from being sepal-like to being petal-like. Each whorl has either three or sometimes two tepals. And so what we'll look for is 
um, again, this multiples of three as a clue, it might be this family. The androecium, um, so the stamen, there are six of them. They have spiral derangement and they have valvular dehiscence. We've talked about that before. Um, in Loraceae, we said there was valvular dehiscence. And so this is a second case. That's again, an unusual trait. The gynoecium has only one carpal. And so that is different from the norm of the ranunculales, which tends to have multiple parts. Um, and it makes it easy to differentiate from ranunculaceae, which had many carpals, and papaveraceae, which had two fused carpals forming one pistil. And so this trait is going to help you if you know it's ranunculales, but you're not sure which family, this trait should get you to the answer. It has a smushed stigma and style. It always to me looks like somebody stepped on it or maybe just smushed it with their thumb. Um, this is a characteristic that is helpful. Um, in some flowers, it's really clear and it will tell you almost immediately that what you're looking at is Berberidaceae. Um, as the name might suggest, Barberry and Berbera, the fruit in Berberidaceae is a berry. So let's look at a couple of examples. First, here is blue quahosh. This is a uh, native wildflower. And you can see the perianth, so the sepals and petals in multiples of three. I'm guessing that there are three petaloid sepals here and then three true petals. But um, without being able to investigate closely, it kind of looks like six petals. You can see there are six stamen, one, two, three, four, five, six. And you can even see that there is only one stigma in there. Um, up here you can see, or down at the bottom, you can see these impressive fruits, which give it its name. And you can see the dissected leaves um, in the uppermost picture. Here's another example. This is Berberis. Um, again, the genus that gives Barberry its name. This is a common landscape plant. Unfortunately, I have it planted in front of our house. And because it's extremely thorny, I haven't made the effort to remove them yet. It is a very bad invasive plant in the Northeast of the United States, um, where it in moves by uh, birds spreading its berries into natural areas and then takes over a lot of the space on the ground in natural areas, thereby uh, sort of shading out native plants. You can see here a really good example of the squished stigma. So here is the carpal, and the stigmatic tissue is this large bulbous um, part that's right at the apex of it, and it almost looks like somebody has flattened it into a Play-Doh ball or something like that. Uh, you can see the berries down here, um, which is another clue. This particular species doesn't have highly dissected leaves, uh, but they are alternate up the stem. And so at least that part is consistent. In summary, we've covered three families within the order Ranunculales. The three families we covered are Ranunculaceae, the buttercups, Papaveraceae, the poppies, and Berberidaceae, the barberries. And to sort of sum up across these families, they tend to be herbaceous, although there are shrubby members in all of them, and we'll see them in at least a couple of the families. The leaves are usually dissected. The flower parts are distinct. And the exception to this is carpels in Papa Veraceae. And all three of these families have hypogynous flowers. So the other flower parts sit underneath the carpel. Conversely, that means the carpel must be superior. What I would encourage you to do is make a flashcard for each family that has the important information on it. I would asterisk the traits that are the most distinctive so you can quickly um, zero in on those traits that will help you identify the families. I would draw pictures of traits when you can. 
Also, please read in your book, read the descriptions of these three families. Your book will go into considerable more detail, but um, the pictures are very helpful and the additional description of the families will help to reinforce this material.